Today, uh, I'm finally going to talk about the action of SF2R on origamis. <clears throat> and so, uh, well, of course, the point is that uh, the linear action of a matrix in SL2R on R2 <coughs> induces uh, an action on uh, origamis. So basically you take each unit square and then uh, you have your origami O which has a certain number of squares, then you apply the matrix, and then uh, parallel sides remains parallel, and so you can still glue. So parallel sides are still parallel, because it's just linear action, and so you can glue sides as before, and uh, in the end what you get is a new object, which is a translation surface. <coughs> Uh, the point is that, uh, uh, in general, uh, GO is not an origami. So, for instance, if you apply uh, this matrix here to the unit torus, to the square torus, you're basically doing something like that. But this is uh, midway between uh, the point where you could cut and paste by translation to recover a square torus. And you can check that this is not a, a origami. Uh, but it's a translation surface. Uh, and then the remark is that, so the remark is that uh, if you take matrices in SL2Z, uh, then uh, this guy is an origami. <coughs> Why? While well, origamis come, as I mentioned, uh, they are presented as covers of the square torus. And so if you act by, by G, uh, the corresponding object has a cover from, well, the image of R2 by G is R2. And then you, you uh, act on the lattice by G. But as Pascal told you, uh, this is Z2. Uh, because actually, well, because uh, SLUZ is the stabilizer of Z in SL2R. Okay, so this is a preliminary remark. So, and also, uh, So when you act by SL2, uh, Z, uh, you get that. So examples. Well, we already saw this this picture many times. So you apply 1, 1, 0, 1. And so this time you are in perfect shape to cut and paste things to recover your square torus. You can also act by the other parabolic. Oops. <laughs> yeah, it's not perfect position. Cut, okay. Something like that. Then cut here, you paste there, and you get your torus. And when you are talking about SL2Z, that's about it uh, in the sense that I'm not going to prove it, but uh, SL2Z uh, is uh, generated. Uh, by these two elements. So in other words, if you want to understand SL2Z, you can start little by little applying these parabolic matrices and then you understand the general element. And this is an idea that we are going to use later today. <coughs> and if you want a reference, I, I recommend uh, Seth's book, uh, especially 
If you can read French, I recommend reading the French version. Cours d'arithmétique. Arithmetic. Actually, there is a very nice uh, uh, joke about that. I think I'm being recorded, so I can tell you in private <laughs> later. But there is a there is a, li a cute joke about this book, about, about this title, but I can tell you in private. <laughs> okay, um, so now it's time to talk about which groups. Uh, so we know that by applying some elements of um, uh, SLQZ, we, we get origamis. And one question is uh, when applying an element of SL to Z gives the same origami. And uh, these are the, the answer is which groups. So actually which groups are by definition uh, so I'm denoting by C by uh, S L O the which group which is by definition the stabilizer of O in SL to Z. So in this case Example, uh, SL of T2 is SL2Z. OK. Um, I prepared uh, another uh, drawing, so to save some time. <coughs> um, if you look at the surface given by the L shaped origami, then uh, when you apply uh, once the parabolic element 1101, uh, what you get is uh, the vertical goes to diagonal 11. So you do that once, twice. So you get this thing here. And uh, well, the same for all vertical sides. And uh, if you look at this picture, you see that you can cut here and here, and then paste these pieces as indicated by the arrow. So you take this there and this there. And you can check that the surface is the L, except that you uh, exchange the identifications. So here, identifications were uh, this side with this side that you see in front of you. And now the, the identifications are uh, crossed. And actually, so this means actually that uh, this element does not belong to the which group of uh, SL uh, O not. But if you apply once more, you can actually see that the picture will be more or less the same, except that you are going to permute once more. So actually, what this means is that when you apply 1101, you go to 0, and so the element 1201 belongs to the which group of this guy. <coughs> uh, similarly, if you apply this uh, the other parabolic matrix, uh, horizontals get slanted this time. Uh, you can do the cutting and pasting along this cycle. So I, I named them A, B, and C, just to keep track of what I'm doing. And then I'm cutting paste, pieces and pasting along the arrows. So I'm putting this piece here, and then A right next, and then this piece there. And actually what I get is a very different surface, which has just uh, uh, one cylinder. I mean, uh, it's just one big rectangle with sides glued like that. So. There are three squares, and the three squares are glued like that. And so this is another origami, uh, O2. And also, and so this means that, I mean, since they are very different, and you can check that uh, they are not the same, uh, this does not belong to SL O, not. But then uh, if you apply once more, you get back to the original, and so you, I mean, I'm not going to do the drawings again, but. You apply once more, and you cut and paste, and you can check that uh, you are back. So actually, if you apply once more, you can also prove that uh, and this element here also belongs to the which group. OK? So which groups are things which are uh, extremely close to sl 2 z orbits. So that, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, when I did this drawing, I can summarize uh, the action of uh, the generators of SL 2 z as follows. So I can draw little diagrams like that. So I have O0. If I apply 1, 1, 0, 1, I go to o, o 1. If I apply it again, I'm back. Then it's you can check that uh, if I apply the other parabolic, you stay here. And then uh, 
you get a, a very nice uh, symmetric diagram in this case with three squares. You apply 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And then uh, for the other parabolic, you stay here. So it's a little graph which follows the SL2Z orbit of uh, SL2Z orbit of O0. And actually, how do you deduce uh, the beach group? You just look at loops which bring you back to O0. In particular, uh, 1, 1 times 1, 1, which is 1, 2, 1, brings you back. This brings you back. This brings you back, etc. So you can read off elements of the beach group by looking at the graph. So, I mean, th these two things go together, SL2Z orbit and beach groups. Of course, uh, it's a little uh, painful um, to make drawings of these uh, things, especially when you have big origamis. So it's a nice idea to try to do this combinatorially. I mean, you not have to look at pictures and uh, have to figure out every time where you cut and paste uh, and if they are same or not. So let's try to do the same exercise, but combinatorially. So combinatorially, you have to understand what these matrices uh, are doing to the origami. So let, let's apply first uh, 1101. And actually, I'm going to give canonical names. I like to call this matrix T. And the other one will be S, so the, the other generator. <coughs> um, so by definition, this matrix uh, takes your square like that to a new square. And now in this new origami, so we have an origami O here. You have an origami T of O here. You want to understand what that means to go uh, to the right and go up. So if you want to go to the right, I mean, before you had this arrow here. And here, you go to the right by this direction. So actually, you see that the horizontal permutation, H, which gives the neighbor, neighbor to the right, doesn't change. You still see HN here. So from N, you still see HN. Uh, on the vertical direction, uh, something funny happens, because you want to go along this direction here, right? To go up from this square. I mean, this square that I'm, I'm looking at is form. This, this is just half of the square. There is another half which comes from other place. So to go up in this picture, it's going anti-diagonally in this picture. And anti-diagonally corresponds to go H inverse first and then V after. So this is the square V H inverse N. So what I'm telling you is that T acts on pairs of permutations as H V H inverse. And by symmetry exchanging, um, well, this is a nice trick uh, when you do, uh, especially in math Olympias. You should always keep track of symmetries so that you don't have to make the same calculations twice. So if you change H and V, you get the picture for the other parabolic. So, and the formula is that. Um, <coughs> and these, uh, these kind of transformations, they have a special name in group theory. They are called Nielsen transformations. And uh, these are transformations which are introduced by Nielsen. Uh, to figure out when a given set of uh, elements of the free group are generating the free group. And basically, you can recognize. Yes? What is N? What is N? Is that the name of the. Yeah, Nielsen, Nielsen. It's a mathematician. No, no, no. Uh, no? Inside the square. Ah, N is just some number. Some, yeah, I'm just saying it's, it's some square. Oh, oh, it's the. Okay. Yeah, it's just some square. I mean, uh, it's an abstract square. Yeah, so and this is square n, and then I'm trying to figure out what are the neighbors after this transformation on the right and on the top. <coughs> okay, um, so these are Nielsen transformations. So this is very cool. Uh, they are appearing group theory. So one consequence of this thing, corollary, is that the permutation group that I introduced at last time, which are, is the group generated by the permutations induced by h and v on squares, uh, is uh, SL2Z invariant <coughs> because you are just replacing the generators by generators which generate the same set. Right? If, if you know H and V, H inverse, you know H and V. <coughs> Why is it H inverse? Uh, because when I go back, I'm doing that. And 
this direction is h inverse. I mean, h is that. Yeah. But this is why perhaps the H minus one, like you, you know, uh, you, you, you see what I would do, I would put the e matrix e coefficient of, as powers, and it's not exactly what, what you would expect, you would expect H V H. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, th there is a matter of convention. Actually, there is a little uh, uh, convention here that uh, what I mean by square n in this business. I mean, I could have chosen to be this guy or this guy. And uh, this also changed there. Yeah. So there is a, a, lot, a lot of convention that I'm putting under the carpet. But uh, I'm choosing one formula, one set of formulas. Yeah, but you are absolutely right. This is, yeah, I'm going a little bit fast because I, uh, yeah, I, have, I think I have many things to say today. And I have just one hour. So let's see. Yeah. What is sigma? So this is the permutation group that we introduced at last time. Oh, I see. Yes. I, 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 yeah, so it's the permutation group generated by H and V. So it's the group generated by H and V seen as elements of the symmetric group of the set of squares of O. <coughs> okay. And so uh, why I'm talking about that? Um, well, uh, I have two options, I guess. Yeah, so the first option is to compute. Yeah, so let me put it down. So, yeah? Hmm? It, it's by, yes, but it's by changing the generators, like I mean, like I, I just explained. To, yeah, I, I'm passing a little bit quicker. Yeah, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> Yeah, so let, let me show you how, how fast faster the computations go, because especially because you, you are doing with permutations, uh, you don't have to do all these drawings. So let me show you, uh, for instance, how to, for example, uh, so O naught is this origami, which is one, two, three, with identifications like that. So the permutations are one, two, three, and uh, one, three, two. And so if you want, uh, so let me apply, uh, say, the element S. No, so first T. So T uh, corresponds to change uh, this pair. Into, uh, so one, two, three, this is a change. And then it's H inverse uh, V. So two, so one goes to two, two goes to two, uh, two goes to one, one goes to three. Uh, and uh, three goes to three, which goes to one, so close. And this means this means that uh, actually vertically, when you go up in this model, uh, you just see one big cycle, which is coherent with the picture that we had of O1, because O1, I remember, it was like that. The identifications were crossed. So when you go up, actually you cross one square, two squares, three squares. So it's coherent. So you quickly see the geometry just from the combinatorics. Now, if you apply S to this pair of permutations of O1, you get uh, one, two, three. Uh, and then, uh, so it's V inverse. So one goes to uh, three, three. Uh, three goes to uh, two, one. And then two goes to two, of course, but let's see here. And this is not the same uh, permutation as before, right? Hmm? The vertical one should be the same as O0. Yeah, so the vertical one is the same as the form. Oh, so this is S of T of O0? Yeah, S of O1. Ah, it's O1. It's O1. And so uh, last time I claimed that O1 is invariant under that, and so I put a little arrow to itself. But you don't quite see the same permutations uh, between uh, this and that. But of course, my things are taking modulo simultaneous conjugation. So I have the right to change the names of labels. So let's do that. So let's build a dictionary, sending these permutations to that, that one. So uh, you should map, say, two to three in this business to recover this cycle here. Once you did that, uh, the next, next natural step, so 
uh, you look downstairs, uh, and then this guy was named Tree. And so Tree should go, uh, sorry, this guy was named Tree. So Tree should go to 1, which is the next guy. So 3 to 1. And finally, well, 1 to 2. So if you do this substitution on this guy, applying phi to here, so changing alphabet, uh, now you forget about these uh, unsets and you apply. So you see that it, it becomes, uh, so 2, 3 becomes 1, and then 2 becomes 3. And uh, downstairs it's 2, uh, 3, 1, which up to, I mean, it's the same permutation, right? So 1 goes to 2 and etc. and 1 to 3. So if you apply this map, you get back to O1. So this is really O1, modulo this as a, as a morphism. OK? So when you're computing orbits, there is these two tricks. Apply these transformations and uh, always keep an eye for this possibility that you are relabeling things. So actually, this is how Sage works. So in Sage days, you are going to see this thing. So you can ask uh, uh, your friends, uh, Martin, Samuel, and uh, Vincent. So I think the full team is here now. Uh, but this is how, uh, how behind the scenes, I mean, when you put origami and apply enter, this is what the computer is doing for you. So as an exercise, I'd like to propose to you to do the computation of uh, the Vich group of the following origami. Yeah, I think Barak and the, yeah, the others are laughing, so. Which is the Vomix alpha, the Erlangen Vomix alpha. So, I recall that these squares are elements of the Quaternionic group. You go to the right by multiplication by i. And you go up by multiplication by j. <clears throat> and so the exercises compute the Vich group of EW. So I have a home exam. And I want, I want the answer to this exercise for tomorrow, because actually I'm going to use that tomorrow. <laughs> for us, uh, some computation of Lyapunov exponents. <clears throat> so I want the exercise for tomorrow. <laughs> OK, um, let's see. Um, so these which groups uh, and these remarks are important in the theory. So, uh, so open questions about these objects. So it's always no, uh, I mean, it's always good to know that uh, uh, we are not so smart as we pretend to be. So there are open questions that we can solve. Uh, so for instance, uh, classification of SL2Z orbits, classification of SL2Z orbits. It's a hard problem. I mean, uh, the little things that you know are due to Pascal, Hubert, and Samuel Lelievre, and Mark Mullen. And what those guys show that is that you can phrase it as this invariant here, the permutation group is a complete invariant in H2. <coughs> okay. So this is another way of phrasing the result. I mean, a quick way of phrasing this result. Uh, but, and uh, we have some conjectures, uh, some conjectures. I mean, some numerical supported uh, evidence, so some conjectures about H11 and H4. And uh, you can ask Samuel and uh, Vincent for more conjectures. Um, and of course, the other question in this business is uh, which uh, subgroups of SL2Z are which groups? And here uh, we know that uh, so uh, Gabi Shimtusen. Uh, uh, show that, for instance, principal 
congruence groups are which groups. She has a lot of constructions for this business. Uh, we know that uh, in H2, uh, they are non-arithmetic. Uh, so they are not principal, I mean, they are not, they, they don't contain the principal ones. <coughs> and uh, Ellenberg and McReynolds, sorry, prove that uh, if gamma contains uh, minus identity uh, and gamma is a subgroup of the congruence group gamma 2 uh, so finite index of course uh, then gamma is a which group sure I'll try um, yeah, so so this is basically what what we know, more or less. Yes. Um, it, it not containing the principal groups. Yeah. So actually, the projections uh, mod p you can check they are always ev everything or one third of everything. For an integer, so it, it's far from being ar arithmetic. Yeah. When you're arithmetic, the projection decreases, right? So. <coughs> okay. Um, yeah, so maybe I'm something. Yes? Uh, I wrote that uh, there is a paper by Ellen Bagg and Mike Reynolds. Which says what? Says that if you take a group containing minus identity, and? which is a subgroup of the principal group, principal congress group of level two, which is finite index, then it's a which group of some someone. Okay. Um, okay, so these are the results. I, I think I'm not forgetting anything. Oh, yeah, so one, one remark that I forgot, because I, I mentioned the word finite index here. Uh, the remark is that uh, first, when always reduced, uh, the which group is a subgroup of SL to Z, because actually you should preserve the period uh, because uh, of the lattice of periods, so period lattice equals to Z2. And actually, uh, it's a finite index subgroup. So I said to this subgroup is finite index. And why finite index? It's because uh, this is SL to Z orbit is finite, because there are only finitely many per permutations in the world with n uh, symbols. So it's, of course, finite index. So this is why I added this condition here. Otherwise, it makes no sense. OK? So which groups are very nice finite index subgroups of SL to Z? And I'm going to fast forward now to other actions. So let's see. OK, so um, now, uh, so what is 11? Ah, here. Yeah, now I think I'm going to talk about automorphisms. I talked about which group I'm going to talk about automorphisms. So automorphisms. So automorphisms are the usual stuff. I mean, uh, sure. Um. What? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. So ah, I understand. Yeah. Uh, it point out some somebody. No. Yeah. So it's a poor state of affairs in some sense. Yeah. It's a good. Yeah. A good. Pro uh, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> yes? Yeah, so the last remark I made is that uh, uh, which groups are finite index? Because they are the stabilizers of uh, the origami in the SL2Z orbit. And the SL2Z orbit is finite because it's just a bunch of pairs of permutations. So. Okay, um, what, what, uh, how uh, I use it just to make sure that my which group is a subgroup of SL to Z. Uh, and this is because uh, it, the, the lattice uh, of periods is Z2. And so my matrices are stabilizing this lattice. And so the stabilizer of Z2 is SL to Z. So it should be a matrix in, in this group. <coughs> OK, so automorphisms. 
So automorphisms, uh, if you are very boba key, uh, you define it as, well, you have this structure, right? So you have the translation structure, so Riemann surface and this guy, and it's simply an automorphism of this structure, so holomorphic map respecting this thing. <coughs> so automorphism is this thing. So down to earth, what this means is the following. You know that locally omega is dz. So uh, in order to respect dz, when we change coordinates, uh, a is locally a translation. So in other words, you are just taking the, the set of squares that you have, you are, the, you are sending them to other places, to other squares, in a way which is compatible with the identifications, of course, to get the same object. Okay. Uh, notation, so notation. Uh, out O is the group of uh, automorphisms, so group of automorphisms. And of course, it's always good to have examples. So example, I'm back to my regular ray gummies. <clears throat> and so I take a group G, which is generated by two elements, R and U. And uh, from this proce procedure, we have an origami, which is multiplication on the right by R, multiplication by U on the right to go up. So this is the construction of the regular origami. And now I claim that for uh, any element of G, uh, this induces an automorphism. So I should explain how X squares are going to be changed. So I'm going to translate this square, g, to the square a times g, but multiplying on the left. And of course, this is the identifications because uh, associativity is commutativity, as Sullivan likes to say. So associativity is commutativity. So Sullivan. So what this means is that, of course, if you multiply by a first and then by r after, it's the same thing as uh, a times g r, multiplying by r first and then g, right? So this commutes. Uh, <coughs> okay, and so this means that this respect identifications, and so it's an automorphism of this structure. And so in particular, I proved that, so in particular, uh, G, it's a subgroup. It's isomorphic to a subgroup of out of this origami, O, G, R, U. And the exercise is to show that G is isomorphic to this group. This is all you get. <clears throat> and it's not a difficult exercise. It's just recalling that you want to respect identifications. So once you decided where to map the square one, that's it. Okay, so now, um, so in particular, regular origamis, they are rich. I mean, they have a rich group of automorphisms. So let me give you a, a, a negative result of origamis which have no non-trivial automorphisms. So, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I see, I see many hands. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's hard to concentrate, so. Yes? Uh, are these two elements uh, We are going back to that point later. So I'm going to answer that question, but not now. Good question. It's just that when you multiply by a first and then by r, it's the same thing as multiplying by r first and then r. So these two operations commute. Multiplying, multiplying on left and right is commute. Okay, so proposition. <coughs> proposition. If you take an origami in the mean atom, so with just a single conical singularity, uh, then the automorphism group is trivial. And the proof is the following. You take uh, T 
uh, I mean, you try to take an element which is not trivial, uh, and you consider the cover of the origami by the group generated, the cyclic group generated by T. So you have a cover of uh, origamis actually, right? So origami, origami. <clears throat> now, um, this origami has a single market point. I'm going to call it star. Actually, I'm going to call it star prime here and star there. So the unique conical singularity. And what happens, the picture is the following. You take a small loop. So a small loop. So a small loop. A small loop around star prime uh, lifts to a small loop. Why? Yes? Doesn't this contradict or something? No. No, no. This contradicts primitivity, because this origami might have genus 2. This could be 3, and this could be genus 2. Ah, oh, that's what I meant, primitivity. It contradicts primitivity, not reducing, yeah. Yeah, so let me, uh, yeah, so you have this origami O prime, and now you take a small loop. And actually, there is a funny fact about uh, surfaces, which is you can look at loops from inside or outside the surface. And if you look at this loop from outside, you learn in uh, differential topology that the outer part of the surface is a product of commutators. Product of commutators. Right? But this cover is cyclic, in particular, abelian. So when you lift, the small loop goes to the small loop. So this means that this cover uh, is a, uh, so this cover is uh, unramified. And so if the degree was non-trivial, a star would have at least two pre-images and a contradiction because you have only a star as a singular point. A star is the market point on O which is the unique conical singularity. I mean, you are assuming that you are in the minimal stratum. Minimal stratum means there is only a conical singularity of total angle uh, 2 pi times uh, 2 g minus 1. <coughs> OK. Um, yeah, so in minimal strata, you don't have automorphisms. For regular origamis, you have plenty of automorphisms. And so this is the world. I mean, <laughs> you can choose your favorite uh, origami and uh, your favorite and depending on uh, if the, it has automorphism or not, the theory becomes uh, more interesting or not in certain aspects. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to pass now to um, a final homomorphisms. <coughs> yeah, I think I can talk about a final homomorphism right now, which is a little generalization of uh, automorphisms. I mean, automorphisms are very rigid. They are just translations of squares. And uh, I want a, a, a group which is a little bit richer. Richer. Why? It's because this group here is the correct group encoding these operations of cutting and pasting. We are going to see that. But let me first define them and then uh, talk more about, about philosophy. So a final memorphisms. So what is the definition? Well, definition is the following. It's, a, it's someone from the surface. Uh, uh, locally described by affine maps in translation chart, translation charts. So I defined them last time. It's basically you take a point and then you take the center of the chart to be P, then you integrate uh, little paths around P to Z. And so this gives you a chart, and I want my guy to be affine in these coordinates. So in particular, an example, so notation first. So F O is the group of affine homeomorphisms. Uh, actually, I want them to be uh, orientation preserving, orientation preserving 
uh, homeomorphisms. This is all I did for my setting of translation surface. Otherwise, I have tr half translation. So this is a group. And the remark is that automorphisms, they look like translations. And translations are fine. So this is a subgroup of that. <coughs> also, an affine map is a composition of a matrix plus translation. In other words, you can decompose groups of affine in the maps as a same direct product. So if you look at this phrase carefully, I mean, if you think at it at home taking a coffee, this means the following. This means that actually to an affine homomorphism, I can take the derivative. So taking the derivative means take the linear part. I can take just the matrix, matrix part and forget about translations. And if I do that, actually there is a single matrix representing all these affine maps. And this matrix, since I'm sending my, my origami O to itself, you can check that this matrix belongs to the which group. It's precisely the definition of which group. It's the matrix that is stabilizing the origami. And so the derivative, taking the linear part, gives you an arrow like that. I already mentioned to you, so I need more space. So I'm going to do derivative like that. I also mentioned that there is an enclosure here of the automorphism. And actually, you can prove that this thing can be completed into a short exact sequence. So this is a fancy way to say that this is subjective and this is injective. OK? <coughs> so we understand the structure of a fine as a same direct product of SO and out. And by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, out, since it's automorphism of a Riemann surface, it's a finite group. OK? So this is, this is a finite group. Sorry, I mean, this main line, what is capital X here? And the uh, it's just another representation of uh, the Riemann surface and the one form attached to the origami. No, 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 the Riemann surface, no, the Riemann surface okay. and the, the, the form associated to the origami. No, not universal cover, not <coughs> anything complicated. So in particular, so this is a finite group. So what I'm saying, uh, I'm, I'm answering your question, uh, I think, right now. So automorphisms are the guys whose derivative is identity. So translations are exactly that. And uh, affine homomorphisms basically corresponds to elements of the Vich group except for a little ambiguity that I can compose with automorphisms. But so up to a finite, up to a finite group, affine and SL are the same. And so in other words, if you are taking a finite cover, you can pretend that each group is the same thing, is acting on your surface. But this up to finite cover is uh, usually pose a lot of headache in this domain. It's the reason between uh, manifolds and orbifolds in this business. But anyway, remark. If out is trivial, then affine is really isomorphic to SL. Oh. <coughs> and I, I'm going, uh, and for this lecture, I'm pretending that uh, so this will be always the case. And what was the thing about the finite cover? Yeah, the, I, I can comment on that later. It, it's just the fact that uh, you can get. You can pretend in some situation that this is really an isomorphism uh, by so taking a finite cover. No, 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 it's not, it's not in that sense. It's not, yeah, I, I take back my phrase. I said nothing. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, because I want to have this, this discussion, but not right now, but later. Um, yes? Yeah, I, I actually, I'm going to compute the action of uh, in a fine in a second. So, yeah, but actually, yeah. So, I, I, when I talk about homology, I'm going to explain how you see these actions. So, just ho hold on. So, another remark that I want to make. Yeah, my so time, time is going very fast. So another remark that I want to make is that it, you you should uh, ask uh, John Smiley about the following thing that half uh, is 
So what, what, where these groups come from? Actually, it's the stabilizer of um, the uh, origami in the mapping class group. Uh, it's stabilizer of the SL2Z orbit, uh, SL2R orbit in modular space. So in other words, when you do this touch mirror and modular construction, the mapping classes that you are going to use to cut and paste are precisely the affine guys. You don't have to look at all mapping class. So this is why the life is simpler for square tile. You don't have to look at all mapping class, but just this, which are not far from the beach group. So this is why life is simpler for origami. So this is why I like origami, because many, many abstract concepts and notions simplify a lot. So affine is the stabilizer. Affine of the origami. O. It's the stabilizer of the SL2R orbit of O in the modular space it belongs to. So I, I'm not going to give details, so this is why I told you uh, ask uh, John Smiley for more details. Because actually he proved not only that, but he knows that this orbit here plus SL2R O uh, is closed. It's a closed submanifold, suborbifold of the modular space. The closed uh, orbifold uh, in modular space, uh, isomorphic to SL2R modulo SLO. And this is why we call the orbits of origamis Tashimula curves. So the name Tashimula curve comes from the following fact that SL2R modulo SLO, uh, it was mentioned by Pascal, I think, that this is the unit uh, cotangent bundle to the hyperbolic surface, which is the quotient of H by SLO. Uh, this object here, it's a Riemann surface. But uh, if you ask algebraic geometers, they are going to laugh at you because this is not a surface, this is a curve. Because it's one dimensional over the complex. So this is why this object is called the Schmuller curve. H is the hyperbolic plane. <coughs> so this was the content of. Why it's called the curve, but why is it called the Uh Yeah, because it's actually uh, totally geodesic for the Tashimula metric, which was introduced by Chris. <coughs> okay. Uh, the last sentence was, it's called Tashimuller curve. Well, curve, it, it's expanded here. And Tashimuller because it's totally geodesic for the metric uh, that Chris was talking about, the Tashimuller metric. So totally geodesic means that when you try to tr trace geodesics between points, they stay in these locus. They don't get out before coming back. <coughs> OK. So this is just to explain a little bit of the nomenclature, but this is not what I, I want to do. I promised to you that I want to be elementary, so I'm going to do calculations. I mean, I, I want to be silly. So I want to do calculations, not fancy stuff with uh, Hodge bundles and things like that. I want to be, I, I want you to be able to, sure. Uh, no, 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 no. It's a, it's a subgroup of the mapping class group. So the, the are, uh, is so that is on space. Yeah, so I really don't want to take uh, this discussion longer, but the, the idea is that you look at the Schmuller space, you look at this asset to our orbit, and the elements, the mapping class elements that you need to bring this thing down to moduli space. Right? Between Tashimuller and moduli, there is a quotient. So you take some group elements to, to bring it down. And what I'm claiming is that the only elements that you need to bring this object from Tashimula to Moduli is this group. That's it. But I don't want to go into that. I mean, I want to be elementary. So, so let me talk about homology of origami. So just to answer your question about uh, how automorphism act. So homology of origami. <coughs> so homology of origami. So let me give you a crash course on homology. Let's see what the <laughs> I can do so. 
So basically, an origami, I always, I'm always drawing a generic square as n. And I'm going to take the following cycle. So on this guy, I'm going to mark all corners of all squares. And I'm going, going to draw all cycles. So the horizontal cycle going this way is sigma n, by definition. And this guy going up is zeta n. And so by identifications, this side here is zeta of v of n, uh, h of n, sorry. And this cycle here is sigma of v of n. And in homology, there is a thing which is every time we see cycles bounding some surface, they should add up to 0. So if I do sigma plus this thing, minus this, minus this, I get 0. So this means that I have these cycles which form vectors in a vector space, which is the relative homology. And these vectors satisfy the relation. OK? So you can think of the relative homology as a module relative homology. So it's the vector space generated by these cycles, sigma and zeta, with these relations. OK? It's just a vector space. It's usually H1 origami sigma for the marked points. Z or R or Q, depending on how we are doing our linear combinations. So let's put R just to make R vector space. <coughs> I'm marking all corners. So sigma is all corners, really all corners. So how do you pass from this to absolute homology? Uh, well, you notice that uh, yeah. So just to answer your question, uh, automorphism act by uh, permuting sigmas and, etas, and zetas, because they are translating squares into other squares. <coughs> so it's just a permutation on, on this base. Of course, there is this relation, so it, <coughs> what makes things richer is, are these relations, of course, which are dictated by the geometry. Otherwise, it would be just cycles, and uh, you could understand very everything very easily. But there are some quotients to take. So absolute homology, you just have to remember that when you draw a cycle like that, there are points in the boundary. And the boundary of a cycle, so boundary, is just the formal difference between this point and this point. Point at end minus the point at the beginning. And the absolute cycles, so absolute cycle, has a zero boundary. <coughs> OK. So it's all combinations that you can make of sigmas and zetas, so that when you look at the boundary in this way, you don't see any everything cancels out. <coughs> so this is absolute homology. So it's a vector space of dimension, uh, vector space of dimension 2G. G is the genus. Uh, usually denoted by H, 1, O, R. Well, and then there are coefficients, Z, R, C, whatever. <coughs> and um, inside this, this space, we have um, a plane, which is interesting for origami, which is called the tautological plane. <coughs> so the tautological plane is basically the silliest way you can think of getting rid of boundaries. So how do you get off? So so how that, how do you get rid of boundaries? You can basically take a, a big cycle sigma, which is just the sum of all sigma n's, because all, every point is uh, at the beginning of one cycle and the end of another, so it cancels. Similarly, you can take zeta to be the sum of all zetas, and so these two vectors span. A space which is called the tautological plane. I mean, it's a two dimensional space, so this is tautological plane. <coughs> okay. Now, this, homo this, homo this absolute homology is a rich, is a, has a more another structure, which is the intersection form. Intersection four. So the point is that in absolute homology, 
when you have two cycles in the surface, you can look at how they cross each other. I mean, cycles are oriented. And so you can look at how they cross each other. And each time you see an intersection like that, you count as plus one. If you see an intersection which is not oriented like the usual basis of R2, you put a minus one. And this, accounting for these plus and minus ones, gives a symplectic form. A symplectic form on H1, which is the intersection form for obvious reasons. We are looking at intersections. And actually, this space, so the, the homology, decomposes as the sum of the topological plane and the symplectic orthogonal, so symplectic orthogonal to H10, to H1 standard. And so this is just, I mean, this symplectic orthogonal is just a fancy for the following thing that H10, actually, they are the cycles with zero allonomy. So what is allonomy? It's just a cycle alpha, so that we, when we integrate the form, we get zero. So the total displacement of the cycle horizontally and vertically is zero. <coughs> And this, this is basically by definition. Well. <coughs> because it, because uh, huh? uh, segment zeta, good question. So very nice. So example, uh, example. Sigma and zeta in this order intersects as a total number of squares. Because they cross each other once in the middle of every uh, square. OK. Um, yeah, so yeah, so it's not a normalized sympathetic form. So it's not a, yeah, you could normalize by dividing the cycle by the square root of, well, but uh, to, to make this one. But I'm not going to do that. So this is why I'm taking my coefficients over r, just not z, just to avoid little technicalities. OK, so this is the composition and homology. I think I have uh, five minutes. I don't know how uh, when I started, but uh, let's say five minutes. Um, so I just want uh, to start with you something which is very beautiful. So this is why I want to take five minutes, uh, which is uh, actually how you do computations with this stuff. Uh, yes, yeah, so actually, I'm taking these minutes because I, I, I'm sure that I have not started at uh, 11.30, so yeah, so let me. Let me steal a little, a few minutes, just to explain you a little bit of a cylinder decomposition, then twist, and turn some construction. So let's do this in a concrete example. Yeah. So no, hold on. I mean, it, it, these are fancy names, but for very concrete things. That, that's the point. I mean, my, my my whole point in this mini course is to show you that these things are very concrete uh, stuff. I mean, you get numbers and matrices, and so let's see. Um, so action. Uh, in homology. So, if you ask uh, Samuel uh, and Vincent, they will tell you the following. So, how the element T acts on origamis. So, basically, you have an origami here. T sends it to another origami there. And I have this basis, sigma n and zeta n. So, I told you that this guy gets slanted like that. And uh, actually, let me give a name for this origami, O prime. And so the basis of this guy is sigma n prime and something here, which is zeta n prime, right? And so <clears throat> you see, and actually here, this cycle, I told you, the permutation to go up is sigma prime. So prime is just to the base of this origami. Sigma prime v h inverse n, right? So the action on relative cycles of t is very easy. It's just sigma n goes to sigma n prime and zeta n goes to zeta n prime plus sigma v h inverse n prime. That's it. I mean, oh, th that's what Sage does for you. Sage so just take, takes advantage of this thing. So the 
description of these things in this relative basis is very easy. Of course, uh, things get trickier when you go to absolute homology because you have to queue boundaries, and so the choices of bases get more complicated. But at the level of relative homology, it's really that. I, I, le I let you figure out what happens for the other matrix, S. <clears throat> and so, uh, in principle, the, this allows you to compute everything in absolute homology. But this is in principle, I mean, this is not people doing, so, doing pra so in practice, in practice, what people do is the following. Um, um, so we are going, uh, uh, we're starting the discussion today, and then uh, maybe I will stop in the middle, and then we can continue tomorrow. But let me at least start a little bit of the discussion. So let's understand how uh, things act on this on this example. So on this example, uh, instead of picking all sides and uh, starting blindly, it's better to take advantage of the geometry. So I'm taking the following cycle. So one cycle, I'm going to call it sigma 2, is this cycle here. It's absolute because it goes from the same point to itself. So it has no boundary. So this is sigma 2. Uh, this is sigma 1. Uh, this is uh, vertical, zeta uh, 1, and this long <laughs> is zeta 2. So I'm putting one for the short horizontal vertical and two for the long horizontal vertical. So actually, the first thing you should notice, so let's start the discussion. So first thing is that this surface has genus 2. And I promised to you that the homology has dimension 4, 2G. So I claim that these four cycles uh, span uh, H1. So basically, you have to check that they're linearly independent. And how do you check this? A good way is to use the symplectic form. So let me show you how, why um, sigma 1 is not a multiple of sigma 2. OK? So why? It's not true. Why this relation is not true? Well, you take the intersection of sigma 1 and sigma 2 with the cycle zeta 1. So you see that if you take this equation and you apply the symplectic form, you see that sigma 1 uh, zeta 1 is 0. And on the other hand, it should be lambda times sigma 2 uh, zeta 1, which is 1. So uh, sigma 2 zeta 1 is 1. So it's lambda. So lambda is 0. OK? So if you try to write, so these guys are independent. So this means that uh, sigma and sigma 2 are independent. And actually, this is how you check cycles are independent on a surface. You look for intersections, and then you try to distinguish them. Some, so some curves go into parts of the surface that others don't go, so they are independent. Um, yeah, so my time is uh, running. Uh, down, so uh, I propose to stop here. So at least I found a nice basis of the absolute homology. And tomorrow, I'm going to pick from this point to teach you how to compute actions of affine homomorphisms. Thank you.